Hi, let's take a deep dive into point seven of the journey, open book selling and buying. As a general rule, I don't think that channel partners, that's what we call ourselves, uh, but at the individual level, I don't think most of us are thinking about uh, shared win-win supply chain effectiveness. Uh, rather, we all tend to have our one or two metrics uh, that we're hyper-focused on. Often we're incented by them, so we, we tend to, if we have a hammer, we say every problem is a nail, and we fine-tune what is. We, we understand that. Um, the idea of, of kind of going open book, uh, that flies in the face of so much uh, win-lose, zero-sum uh, thinking and conditioning and playing, really. Um, even with our own employees, the idea of opening book, well, you know, if they see my bottom line, they're going to want half of it kind of thing. And, and you know, the employee is thinking, hey, they're trying to hire me as cheap as they can and work me as hard as they can to make the most money on me. So there's that exploitive capitalistic um, a tone that, that prevails at first level thinking, particularly when we're in our own little silos looking at our one or two metrics. We don't really think about, well, wait a minute, if there's extreme profits or extreme losses, how can we frame that so that it can w it can be a win-win? And when you we, we look at it, there's usually a way. Um, so if we have a profit and loss statement uh, for a customer and, and a supplier, and uh, you know, obviously, I think we'd probably be more inclined to do it with a big losing customer, a big losing supplier. But remember earlier, I, I alluded to a case study um, with SK, SKU and supplier whale curves, where uh, a distributor sat down with their number one most profitable supplier and looked at their most profitable items and said, we assume they're your most profitable items also. And the supplier said, well, you know, I don't know exactly that that's the case, but I, I, my intuition tells me that's exactly the case. So I would love to sell more of my core items or my most profitable items and, and have you benefit too. So um, very quickly, they were evil, even able to see upside in a win-win kind of environment. Now, if I go out and I ask when, you know, a, a supplier, what's your total sales service cost of taking care of me? They don't know, particularly if I'm talking to one person in a silo looking at their one or two metrics. If I go to a customer and I say to a, a buyer, you know, which, what are the 11 elements of total procurement costs and how do you measure those? They don't know. In fact, being busy with high TPC costs is their job security definition. So I've got to get to the right level, somebody who can look at the whole process and get it and understand it and, and even have the power to sort of say, you know, I see what you're saying and I have the power to change it and to reassure the people in their silos that everything's going to be fine. Sure, we're going to break some eggs to cook some omelets, but they're not going to lose their job. And in fact, uh, what parts get automated or reduced frees up time for them to do higher level productivity opportunities, which makes them more valuable, which is a way that they can earn a raise. So. That's the approach we have to take. And uh, sort of the, the granddaddy of all these things was back in 86 to 88, Walmart and P&G did a huge collaboration to make all of P&G's consumer products go through Walmart's distribution centers with lights out, barcoding, and so forth. And um, it took you know a couple of years, but it was such a breakthrough uh, result that Walmart was then able to get into the grocery business and, and put a lot of grocery guys out of business. So they got from a standing start in 1990, uh, they got into the grocery business and today they have probably 35% national share of groceries in addition to the, the discount store stuff that they've always had. Um, and our most successful win-win partnerships case studies, so we do our twin studies, find our winners and so forth, can inform our least effective ones. Uh, and what's interesting, I'll give you twins, is P&G worked with Walmart, and then Kmart turned around in 1990 and said, oh my gosh, Walmart's killing us. We need to do whatever they're doing. They hired the same consulting firm, Kurt Sam and Associates, to start up. But Kmart was adamant about the cost of making this new uh, continuous replenishment system work would be totally borne by the suppliers and they would make it up in volume. Whereas Walmart said, look, let's flowchart what is, flowchart what could be, and figure out how to share both the costs and the upside. Now, uh, you know, they obviously would want to try to, you know, have more of the upside there, but they made sure there was enough profitability to keep the suppliers on the hook. Kmart drove them all away. And in 1993, Joe Antonini, who I had, you know, the CEO of Kmart, who I pegged as an articulate incompetent in 1990, had a 
meeting for all the supplier honchos to say, look, we're sorry we were so brutal and ham-handed about it. We really want to change our ways. Won't you please come back and, and you know, let's start anew. It was too late. Kmart was uh, was dead. And uh, and amazingly, I think there's still some Kmart stores around, but it's been a, it's been a, a fast uh, imploding kind of story. So uh, once we get fluent with and have the data for P&Ls, for our, our channel partners, that's one half of the coin. And even though our customers and suppliers may not have their half of the of the, the channel activity cost story, uh, ours can serve as proxies for theirs, and it starts a new uh, departure point, a new conversation for win-win economics. Thanks.